With pandemic infection numbers going crazy, along with a bunch of election drama, we've seen the stock market jump up really aggressively and then drop off pretty aggressively in the last week or so. Square, in the middle of that, has also gone up and then gone down. Do we have a lot to look forward to? Is it overpriced? Today, we're gonna take a look at Square. Welcome back to the channel, family. My name is Trey. If you're new to the channel, on this channel, we talk a lot about finance and investing and small business, entrepreneurship, mindset stuff, growth stuff. We have a new series going on, how we grew our small business here in Japan, starting with 200 bucks up to revenues over a million bucks. So click up here if you're interested in checking that out. Um, we also do usually two to three times a week videos looking at stocks or stock terminology or things like that. So if you have a moment, please hit the like button, please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. That would help us out a lot here. We did a video back in August on Square where we looked into a lot of the details, who they are, what they're doing, why they're a little bit different, why they're special and magical. And since then, the stock price has gone up to all time highs. It quickly settled back down afterwards. So in today's video, we're gonna take a look at their most recent earnings, as well as some of the news coming out in terms of like competition, potential threats, what I'm gonna be doing with the company. And just to give you a little sneak peek, I own Square and I've owned it for a while. I love it and I'm enjoying it and I'm continuing to buy into it. But just so you know, we try to look at stocks really unbiased on this channel. I don't wanna like try and program you to be buying Square or anything like that. In a video I did on PayPal recently, I mentioned how it's a good stock, they're doing well, but I personally hate them because I've had so many negative experiences with them as a small business guy. So let's jump in to Square. Square has stated very clearly in their mission statement that their goal is to get everyone involved in the economy and commerce using technologies that make things simple. But put a little bit more simply and maybe a little bit more sinisterly, Square is basically going to replace banks or their goal is to replace banks. So you get your direct deposit from your company into your Square account, into your cash app on your phone. Then you go and you buy your monthly stocks, you buy a little bit of Bitcoin, and then you go shopping at vendors that use Square. And when you do that, you get boosts. Boosts are basically like coupons or discounts or bonus points that you can use to get five bucks off your next pizza or whatever. And so with all of your money being able to just be controlled in this really super convenient and simple app, you won't really need banks in the future maybe? So that is Jack Dorsey, the guy who made Square's vision, I think, for the future. The company is really, really well positioned, especially to capitalize on all the, you know, pandemic related drama we've seen this year. But looking at the stock, we've also seen a massive boom in revenues and expenses. And that's basically all because Bitcoin sales have taken off. And because of the pandemic, people are getting more and more interested in Bitcoin as well. There's a lot to be excited about and there's a lot of change happening. But first, let's take a step back, look a little bit at their history, who they are, and where they're going. Back in 2009, Jack Dorsey and Jim McKelvey started up Square, and they were primarily targeting micro merchants. You've probably seen the hardware that they offer, which is like, they're not trying to make money on the hardware, they're trying to make money on the transaction fees which you'll see in a few minutes here when we look at those revenue charts. And they were targeting these micro shops, micro retail merchants and saying, hey, we're gonna offer you a couple of really good benefits. And the first one is that as soon as somebody swipes, that money is available for you to use in your company's Square account. Now, for me, I use Stripe for a lot of my businesses, but I've used a bunch of other payment processors. And what usually ends up happening is when somebody swipes, you get the money deposited into your account like two or three, sometimes four or five days later. And so it's hard to manage the cash flows. But Square came in and said, as soon as they swipe, you get the money. You can use it right away. And that was like a big relief and kind of a game changer for small retailers. And the second really cool suite of tools that they offered to micro retailers was really in-depth analytics tools based on the way money was coming in, what was being purchased, because all of that is being observed and monitored and controlled through the control panel that Square gives you. And so now these micro retailers have access to this whole suite of tools that they wouldn't have otherwise had if they were just using an old school like chiching, like cash register, where you just have cash going into it and stuff like that. So they can use these tools to improve their offerings, also figure out their cash flows. And on the flip side, Square sees what's going on with all this transactions, what kind of customers are buying there, what your average transaction cost is, and all these different factors. And they can therefore help you to improve your business more or you know, offer loans to support you or things like that. A third really neat benefit that Square offered to micro-emergence was just really quick onboarding. Like you have a 
cell phone, you have a smartphone, you're pretty much ready to go. Uh, interestingly, recently, we're starting to see more and more companies mimicking this. I don't think Square was the first one, but we're starting to see more companies trying to copy that and take a little bit of Square's action because they're seeing just how much potential this has for the future. In their most recent quarterly report, they also mentioned that in markets outside the US, seller gross payment volume grew 46% year over year in the third quarter of 2020. This represented 11% of the total seller gross payment volume. So for a long time, they were kind of only active in small American retail, um, but they're also starting to reach out and offer support and these kinds of payment processing services and analytics services for small retail all around the world. Now, in the last video, one of the concerns that I had was kind of saying, you know, we don't really know what's gonna be happening with retail because of the pandemic. Obviously all the stores are shut down and stuff like that. Interestingly, we've seen in the third quarter stores opening up a lot of stores, a lot of retail stores actually, I've done a video recently on Nordstrom and Foot Locker. We saw their quarterly sales jump up big time after the second quarter was completed. And we're seeing a similar trend here with Square. So actually that concern that I brought up earlier has ended up being not as big of a deal as I thought it might be. But we're also seeing Square's other services like the Cash App starting to play a bigger and bigger part in their revenue stream. Quick plug for a new service that I've been using for a little bit that I like called Hypercharts. This is especially helpful for visual people. I know when you're analyzing a lot of um, like 10Ks and 10Qs and financial statements and stuff like that, it can be a little bit overwhelming to just be looking at millions of numbers all over the place. But Hypercharts has this service. They have a free version and a paid version to get you a little bit more service. But they provide these really super helpful charts that visualize the numbers quarter over quarter or year over year. And they have this for like a lot of really big popular companies. They don't have every company on there yet, but if you find these charts and graphics helpful in your understanding of you know the finances of a company you're looking at, click on the link below to hop over to Hypercharts page and check it out. This Hyperchart here shows gross payment volume. And we can see that indeed there was a really big dip here for the first quarter and second quarter, but we're back up to all time highs at about 31.7 billion gross payment volume. For comparison, the first quarter was 25.7 and then second quarter was 22.8 billion. So that shows you a big jump up to the third quarter. These figures do include retail payments as well as person to person payments through the cash app portion. Though the cash app portion only makes up about 9% of this, while the seller portion makes up 91%. Probably the majority of Square's users are more familiar with the cash app than they are with the micro retail side. The Cash App started up in about 2013 and around that time was when I got it, started using it and playing around with it. It never really became a big part of my kind of like banking workflow. But in recent years, we're seeing that the number of users is increasing like crazy. And initially it was basically peer to peer. So it's like, hey, thanks for pizza, dude. Here's my 10 bucks share kind of thing. But in recent years and quarters, they've added direct deposit. They've added like you can buy stocks and even parts of stocks fractional shares. Uh, now you can buy Bitcoin, which is becoming a bigger and bigger part of their revenue stream as well. Apparently customers who adopted two or more products were three to four times more active on the app and therefore three to four times more profitable. So as we're seeing the app become a bigger part of people's lives, they're much more likely to start buying stocks. They're much more likely to send money to their friends or to pay for stuff or to buy Bitcoin through the app and therefore Square's margins go up. They also mentioned that the daily active users are increasing rapidly, showing the significant impact that this app has had on more and more people. Check it out here, the gray bar is monthly users, and then the daily users is the green bar. So we can see that that green bar basically has like doubled compared to the same quarter last year, which is a really good sign. So now let's take a little bit more of a zoomed in look at the Cash App, since this is becoming the backbone of their business. Check it out on this hyper chart, we have Cash App monthly actives. So compared to last year, we had 20 million users, then quarter by quarter, 24 million, 27 million, 30 million, 33 million. So the higher you see this number going, the more revenues the company is going to be able to make. Of the company's overall $3.03 billion in revenues, the Cash App was responsible for about two thirds of that at 2.07 billion, which is up 574% year over year, 574, that's nuts. This worked out to a gross profit of $385 million, which actually is quite small, but 
a 212% increase year over year. So even though we're not seeing the numbers go really crazy, nor the profit margins, we're seeing really, really big growth. So another often overlooked benefit that Square has when people are just using this as their bank, similar to like how other banks do it, when you put your money in, they'll take some of that and put it out on loans. They'll lend it to people who are buying cars or houses or whatever. Same thing for Square. They have $1.8 billion of your money sitting around in their coffers. And they can turn around and use that to offer other services and make a little bit more money off of that as well. We have seen, however, that that cash balance has gone down a little bit in October, which I'll get into in a minute here at the end of the video. We also saw gross payment volumes inside the Cash App was up 332% year over year to 2.9 billion. Transaction-based revenue in the Cash App was up 320% year over year to 81 million. Subscription and service-based revenue in the Cash App was up 154% year over year to 354 million. This is made up primarily of instant deposit fees and cash card fees. I also mentioned earlier that Bitcoin is becoming a bigger part of the transactions going on in the Cash App. Check out this hyper chart where we can see that the fraction of revenues from Bitcoin is going crazy, especially this last quarter it ended up making more than half of the revenues just from Bitcoin. We're seeing growth in all the other sectors. Again, hardware is not meant to be a big growth sector. Subscriptions and services, we are seeing growth in. Nice growth, actually this last quarter went up about 100 million. And then transactions, 758, 682, and then 925. Actually, if you click up here, you can single them out. So we, we can see individually transactions, 758, 682 and then 925. So again, really big growth and it looks like they're starting to buck the trends. One of the things you have to remember about Bitcoin, unlike anything else anybody sells, is that, for example, this lens, a lens I love for my camera, probably the store that I bought it at, bought it and then marked it up by like 40 or 60 or 80% and then sold it to me. And that's typically the way retail works. But with Bitcoin, you can't go straight to the manufacturer of Bitcoin and get a cheap price. Basically, you have to buy it out on the open market and then you know they add a little bit of a transaction fee and then they make a little bit of revenue. So Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin revenues jumped up big time, Bitcoin expenses jumped up just about as much. And you know they're getting that like really small fee on it, which works out to be their revenue. So on the $1.64 billion in Bitcoin sales, Square generated 32 million in gross profit. So that's like super micro. That being said, sales are up 11 times year over year and gross profit is up 15 times. Though the profit numbers are really small, one of the things you gotta remember when it comes to apps, especially apps for young people, like thinking about like Robinhood and these kinds of apps, like you open it up and it's just like so slick, it's so fun to use, it's just like, wow, I put money in this stock, awesome, I'm doing something good, and you like feel rewarded for using it. And Square has really done that well. That's why we're seeing those numbers boom. And there's a lot to talk about with Bitcoin. This could be a whole other series of videos, but Bitcoin is doing really well now, and the price has gone up more than it has in a long time because of economic uncertainty, because of government uncertainty, because people are looking to diversify and hedge against their own currency weakening while governments are just printing money to give you stimulus packages and stuff like that. There are a lot of reasons to be getting Bitcoin and there's a whole other world of cryptocurrencies as well. I don't really know if the team over at Square plan to be offering a whole library of cryptos in the future, but taking this one big step to start offering Bitcoin pretty much earlier than most other really big banks have, gives us a glimpse into the future of how things might be starting to transform going forward. Jack Dorsey is on record for saying that the internet deserves its own currency, which I think he believes to be Bitcoin. So it could be that in 5, 10, 20 years, you just get your salary in Bitcoin and then you use Bitcoin to do most things. But again, that's a whole other discussion. Governments wouldn't like that, obviously. And there are a lot of other powers that would be hugely threatened by not being able to see everything that's going on in all of your accounts. All that to say, I think Square taking kind of like cutting edge action and just making it really easy to buy and hold Bitcoin more so than like ever really before is opening up a whole new market segment 
of people who just, you know, I like the app. Yeah, it's so easy to buy Bitcoin now. It used to be so hard. I have a cold storage for all my crypto and it's like, you gotta plug it into your computer, put in the passwords, do all the syncing and all this stuff. Like, it's really like a pain in the butt. And Square actually hasn't guaranteed the security of your Bitcoin in your Bitcoin app. By the way, if you're holding any in there, just to be safe, but they're kind of tapping into this thing that could end up being like a whole new world of services going to the future. And we're seeing all these other big banks kind of watching them being like, whoa, we should have started doing that a few years ago. Let's try that now too, kind of thing. So I think all these things contribute to Square's moat. Next, I wanted to take a look at some of the expenses for the overall company, zooming back out from just the Cash App. Check it out here, we have another hyper chart showing operating expenses. Red is product development, yellow is sales and marketing, and green is general and administrative. I wanted to focus in here on sales and marketing. Check that out. Big time growth in marketing spend. A couple quarters ago, 194 million, then 238 million, and now we're up to 348 million. So generally speaking, as a company starts to get more traction, they don't need to market as much, but I think we might not really be at that point yet, as we can see from their marketing expenses, but we are seeing that the additional spend that they're adding on each quarter is paying off big time in terms of user growth and awareness of their services and stuff like that. It'll be really interesting to see how this huge jump that they put in last quarter will affect this quarter as well. This is one of those things that's really, really key for a small growing company. You know, a lot of haters of Square will be like, do they have so many users, but their profit margin so small? I think it's because they're kind of taking the Amazon approach by just plowing the income back into growing even more. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about Square going into the future really long term, because it could be legit like in five or 10 years, like everybody just does everything on Square. Moving on to earnings, check it out. They provided an EBITDA chart here. Um, we see third quarter up 38% year over year, super juicy. And yeah, that number's only 181 million right now, but that's going to start growing multiplicatively going into the future, I believe. This works out to a gap EPS of seven cents per share. And we're starting to get to the point now where even though brick and mortar, the original like big part of their business is still largely like not operational and might become non-operational again soon as the pandemic gets more out of control, we're seeing that Square is becoming profitable despite that. Again, further underlining the importance and strength of the Cash App in their whole ecosystem. They also mentioned that they have $3.8 billion in available liquidity, 3.3 billion of that being cash and cash equivalents. We've also seen in the news recently that Credit Karma is going to be sold to Square. Square will be picking up this tax preparation company, which is a really interesting move because I think it will fit really nicely into their whole suite of services where they can see a lot of merchants see how they're doing and on the other hand, seeing buyers and shoppers and investors and see their behavior, not only is preparing their taxes ultra easy if they're doing most of their transactions in Square already, but they can also learn a lot in really high resolution about individual people and individual shops' behaviors and therefore refine their offerings or loan services or other things like that even more so. But on the flip side, we're seeing more competition from other big banks in terms of like, stepping into Square's kind of territory. I shared with my subscribers a couple of weeks ago when I found out about this news, I think the day it was announced. And if you're not subscribed, by the way, I would appreciate a subscribe. And I love just talking with you guys in the comment section or over on a Reddit or things like that, just so you know. But I posted for the subscribers showing an article. So we saw that JP Morgan has now launched a smartphone card reader that you just connect to your smartphone and then you can swipe credit cards as well as an app. And they're basically seeing the domination that PayPal and Square are dishing out on the market. And they're like, dude, we got to get in on that. JP Morgan Chase is a super duper huge bank. Love them or hate them. I think their market cap is something like six times bigger than Square's. And it's really interesting because I was reading a post on Reddit about this. And there was a guy who works at Chase who was saying, actually, all of Square's transactions are processed through Chase's processing systems. So I don't think Chase has the ability or even a good reason to you know, push Square out of the market completely. But it's clear to see that really, really big players like JP Morgan Chase already have like these central trunks in the whole industry that are controlling so many of the different payments going on and stuff like that. So it could be that 
once JP Morgan Chase gets this service up and running, they can offer services cheaper than Square can because they don't have to pay anybody else for these processing fees. And this all begs the question, is somebody maybe interested in buying Square? You know, I don't think Jack Dorsey and McKelvey started the business with that kind of plan in their mind. And I actually don't think they would be willing to do that because they're too revolutionary in the way they think. I think they're more interested in just being like pushing everybody forward. Like probably a little bit similar to how Elon Musk is like, dude, I don't care about making money. We need to make electric cars. And if I don't make awesome ones now, nobody else has motivation to change. So I'm just gonna make really awesome electric cars and then everybody else is gonna have to play catch up. And then governments are gonna come in changing the laws, making it so you can't sell gasoline cars like California has done. And I think Jack Dorsey is thinking a little bit more along that vein. Rather than thinking like, let's make as much money as we can, he's more like thinking about large areas of the world or large segments of societies where people can't even be involved with banking. And therefore they miss out on a lot of these advantages. They miss out on a lot of the growth and the bonus and benefits of being able to invest and things like that. I think he's more interested in that. So I don't really see a super high chance of them being okay selling the company to a really big you know, competitor bank or anything like that. But that's just my thoughts for now. Another caution point to mention is that, I mentioned earlier that cash holds 1.8 billion of your money in its coffers. Um, they mentioned in October that this number is slowly trending down. And in the US, unemployment benefits are fading away and stimulus money has been spent. We're not really sure when the next stimulus package is gonna come through, but basically, as that number trends down, it's also more likely that users will be buying less stocks or buying less Bitcoin or shopping less, therefore impacting Square's bottom line. And I think we can use this information to temper our expectations for the fourth quarter's numbers coming up here in a couple of months. So what am I gonna do with Square right now at this moment? Personally, I love Square. And personally, my kind of way of doing investing is thinking like an owner of the business, thinking long-term. Square's one of the companies I just really love the vision of, you know, and so they'll be changing the world and they're doing things that people just love to use. So we're seeing revenue growth, we're seeing user growth, we're seeing a little bit of profit growth, but we're also seeing growth in the stock price. So far, my strategy of dollar cost averaging in has been working really well. You know, I'm doing really good on the stock and I continue to be doing so. So a couple weeks ago, we saw it hit a high at about 198. Right now we're at about 179. I really wouldn't be surprised if it dips back lower. But for me as a long-term investor, when I see a dip, I think buy. You know, I'm not scared of dips because I can just buy more because I have cash on hand. Always remember to keep cash on hand. But for those of you who are like more micro, just like, dude, I wanna double my money, dude, I wanna make 30% in a couple weeks kind of thing, Square could be a little bit too volatile for your taste. I'm not really sure and I don't want to make recommendations and that's really not my style of investing. Number one, because I find that it's like super hard. Statistically, it's like terrible odds of success. And number two, because I sleep when Wall Street is open because I live in Japan. So it's not really an option for me to be like, you know, chasing the one minute or the five minute charts. So all that to say, I'm just always buying Square. And in the long term, I believe that that will pay off. That being said, I think we are a little bit overvalued at the moment. Check out this hyper chart showing revenue and operating income. We're seeing operating income is like a little bit up. You know, it's not like, wow, they doubled their revenues so their profit margins went crazy or anything like that. It's just kind of like a little bit up. That being said, it's not negative like it's been for a long time either though, so that's cool. So I don't think it's necessarily worth the price it is right now. I know a lot of more traditional investors will look at the price, 180 bucks, and be like, they're only making that much money though. This is really stupid and not worth it. Um, but I think similar to how Tesla was a year ago with cash, we're paying a premium for how they might change the world going into the future. We're putting a lot of trust in that vision and in changing the world and in the management and stuff like that. So I'm not too worried that the price is overvalued right now. I'm not like buying loads like right now. I'm just kind of, you know, adding a little bit here and there, you know, so. That's my way of doing it. What do you think? Are you gonna be loading up on this stock? Are you selling off while it's a little bit high right now? Are you expecting it to drop down in the fourth quarter and then buy later? What's your strategy? What are you thinking about Square? So those are my thoughts on Square. I love you guys. Have a great week and weekend, depending on when you watch this. And see you in the comment section.